Today we're going to take an up-close look at the horse-powered WIM, a crucial machine in the development of Victoria's goldfields. One of the many important operations in underground mining is the raising of ore, mullock and water from underground. Back in Victoria's gold rush, one of the first machines employed for this work was the windlass. But this device was man-powered, and its capabilities were certainly limited. Steam power was the ultimate solution in 19th century mining. Winding engines and their poppet heads allowed mines to haul far greater weights from far greater depths than simple machines like the windlass. But it's certainly a big leap to go from the man-powered windlass to the steam-powered winding engine. And that was where the whim came in. Whims allowed miners to explore deeper ground, bale more water, and raise more ore than the simple man-powered windlass, and it was far less expensive to put up and run than steam-powered machinery. So let's go take a close look at this brilliant machine, and for this there are a few very interesting places I've got to show you. I'm here at the Stahl Historical Society and Museum, where there's a brilliant model of a horse-powered whim on display. Although these machines had already been in use in the South Australian copper mines from the 1840s, they weren't introduced to the goldfields here until a couple of years into the gold rush, when the shallow diggings were getting seriously deep. This was a direct transfer of Cornish mining technology and there's an interesting story of its history in Cornwall. The whim is said to have derived its name from a fellow named John Costa, a 17th century metallurgist and engineer, who was seen by his associates one day busily constructing some kind of machinery. When questioned about it, he replied, I have a whim in my head, and am trying to reduce it to practice. Interestingly, one of the obsolete meanings of the word whim was a fanciful or fantastic creation. Costa's fanciful creation was regarded with amusement and sarcasm at first, but as it approached completion, the value of the device became clear, and these machines were soon widely used in Cornwall. But the concept was certainly not a new one. Similar devices were used as early as 300 BC in Greece for turning rotary mills and 100 BC in Rome for grinding grain and crushing olives. Whims for hoisting in mines were described and illustrated in Agricola's De Re Metallica, a 16th century book on the art of mining, refining and smelting metals. This machine was a big upgrade from the man-powered windlass and the horse-powered whip. Whims were effectively used for shafts several hundred feet deep, with two buckets or light cages in balance. So how did they work? Well, let's head over to Ballarat to take a closer look. This is Sovereign Hill, a remarkable replicated goldfields town complete with shops, hotels, gold diggings and underground mines to explore. This is one of the best places in Victoria to learn about historical gold mining technologies. And one of the many interesting exhibits here is the horse-powered whim. The main component of the whim is this large drum, which is constructed using thin wooden slats. The drum is fixed to a vertical pole, which is supported by a strong frame. The rope is wound horizontally around the drum several times, and each end of the rope is passed over pulleys and run down the shaft. Beneath the drum is a long beam to which a horse is harnessed. When the horse walks in circles, the drum turns, and one end of the rope is lowered, while the other end is raised. This allowed miners to lower an empty bucket down the shaft while raising a full bucket to the surface. By turning the horse so it walks around in the other direction, the buckets can be continuously raised and lowered in turns. This was the most efficient arrangement, but some whims worked with only a single bucket. Horses were worked very hard on the goldfields. Whims and puddling machines had them walking endless circles. 
Whips had them going in lines back and forth day after day, and many were lowered down mine shafts and employed hauling rakes of trucks deep underground. Whims were sometimes installed underground as well. This brilliant lithograph by Hermann Deutsch depicts a horsewhim in operation underground in the Defiance Mine at Sebastopol. The whim is working at a 45-foot blind shaft, raising one light cage while lowering another. Bro Smythe provided a plan of a horse-powered whim in his 1869 book The Goldfields and Mineral Districts of Victoria, which shows the various components. He also included this section of a whim shaft, which shows the whim, poppet heads and the rope running down the shaft. Originally, the term poppet heads was applied only to the cross pieces of timber which supported the sheave wheels. So although it wasn't a typical poppet head as we think of it today, a whim had poppet heads too. As light cages and bailing tanks were introduced, in order to accommodate them at the surface, the poppet heads had to be raised higher. This resulted in longer poppet legs and sometimes the construction of a sky shaft. Harry Wood's notes on the Ballarat Goldfield, published in 1869, outlined various improvements which were made to the windlass on the Ballarat field over time. But Wood noted that there had been no material improvements to the horse-powered whim. The whim was an efficient machine, and the only change that was really required was their eventual replacement with steam-powered engines. Magnus Eelsang's Manual of Mining states that a 28-horsepower engine could do the work of 300 men on a windlass, or 35 horses on whims, at less cost. If the capital was available to upgrade to steam engines, it was the logical way forward. As sinking got deeper and more groundwater was encountered, winding and pumping engines replaced the old whims out of necessity, and much taller poppet heads were erected. This interesting postcard from the early 20th century shows the old and new technologies, with a derelict whim in the foreground and a poppet head behind it. But even once steam-powered machinery was everywhere on the goldfields, the whim still had its place. The machine was a crucial intermediate step in the development of many mines, allowing them to work and produce gold while raising the capital required for a machinery upgrade. Even when companies had the capital, a whim was often used to get started with shaft sinking before a winding engine was brought to the site. There are some fantastic photos of horse-powered whims in use across the goldfields, and one of the best is this panorama of Stall, where we can see many whims, some abandoned and some still in use. I've got another video which explores some of the machinery shown in this image, which you may be interested to check out. I'll put a link to that in the description. Today it is rare to come across the remnants of a whim site, and if you do, you may not even notice it as all that's typically left is a flat platform where the whim once stood and the horse walked its endless circles. Here you can see the remains of an old whim platform, and you can certainly see how these are easily overlooked. A haunting poem was written about an old whim horse by Edward Dyson. It's quite lengthy, so I won't read it in full, but here are a few select verses. All the hands have gone for the rich reef paid out and the company waits till the calls come in. But the old grey horse, like the claim, is played out, and no market's near for his bones and skin. So they let him live, and they left him grazing, by the creek and oft in the evening dim. I have seen him stand on the rises, gazing, at the ruined brace and the rotting whim. See the old horse take, like a creature dreaming, on the ring once more his accustomed place, but the moonbeams full on the ruins streaming show the scattered timbers and grass-grown brace. Yet he hears the sled in the smithy falling and the empty truck as it rattles back and the boy who stands by the anvil calling and he turns and backs and he takes up slack. He hears in the sluices the water rushing as the buckets drain and the doors fall back. When the early dawn in the east is blushing He is limping still round the old, old track. Now he pricks his ears with a neigh replying to a call unspoken with eyes aglow, and he sways and sinks in the circle, dying. From the ring no more will the grey horse go.
Horsepower was a crucial step in the development of the Victorian goldfields, but it sometimes came at a great cost to the welfare of these beautiful animals. This video is dedicated to all the horses who worked on the goldfields, work which made it possible for miners to explore deeper ground, process more material, bale more water and raise more ore. I'd like to say a huge thank you to the folks at the Stahl Historical Society, to Sovereign Hill and to Sandy Creek Clydesdales. I'll put links to all three in the description below. Thanks for watching this video. If you'd like to learn more about the fascinating history of the Victorian goldfields, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications.